everyone to this important webinar in the lead up to this year's World Cancer Day, which will be observed globally on the 4th of February. We dedicate this webinar to fund of someone who not only inspired us and demonstrated leadership on tobacco control, which is key for reducing the cancer burden, but also bravely fought cancer in her personal life too. Dr. Veena she was such as well as noted educationist. Her daughters to surgeons, one of them, Dr. Vishnu Sharma, who also did a master's in public health, is amongst us. Dr. Vishnu Sharma, we are very happy to have you with us today. And over to you now. Thank you, Shobha ma'am. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this special episode of, uh, of uh, On World Cancer Day. And before we start the webinar on World Cancer Day, I would like to share briefly and pay tribute to my mother, late Dr. Veena Sharma, in whose memory this webinar is dedicated. Dr. Veena Sharma was born and brought up in Uttar Pradesh, India, and she researched new screening techniques on some aspects of chemotherapy and chemo profile axis in experimental Leishman analysis. And her work is well appreciated and well documented in several journals. He did her research in Central Drug Research Institute in India and carried out several studies. Apart from her research skills, she was also an eminent educationist who was also uh, distinct part of uh, Bharti Vidya Bhavan branch of Lucknow and was acted as a principal and vice principal of several schools and colleges. And she also participated and played an active role to stop tobacco abuse among teenagers in society. And as we all know that tobacco is a, one of the major risk factors for cancer. And she consistently seeded an attitude in youngsters to to never give up towards life and her spirit to fight back bravely were her strength during her fight against cancer. But unfortunately, she passed away on 26 June 2014. But her, fire, her motto was to never give up in life that he inherited in us and all the students and all the teachers and all the well-wishers and colleagues. Uh, thanks, Dr. Vishma Sharma. A heartfelt condolence. Is part of life. Over to you, Shobha ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thank you for dedicating the World Cancer Day Global Webinar to commemorate inspiring life of Dr. Veena Sharma. Dr. Veena Sharma's birthday is the day after World Cancer Day. And we join you, Vishma, and your family in celebrating the positivity and light with which Dr. Veena Sharma lived her life and also her resilience and courage to brave the assault of cancer. A numbing reminder of what people with cancer and their loved ones go through before we listen to our experts today on World Cancer Day webinar panel. Without any further ado, let me welcome today's webinar moderator, Ashok Ramsuru, who is a widely acclaimed international award-winning journalist based in Durban, South Africa, with over 40 years of rich experience in journalism. He was the senior producer at South African Broadcasting Corporation and recently delivered guest lectures in King George's Medical University and SGPG, IMS, and Prime Minister's Skill Center in India too. Over to you, Ashok. Lovely greetings from Durban, South Africa. Let me begin with a good promising news. Governments around the world have committed to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs by 2030. And one of these goals is to reduce the untimely deaths caused by non-communicable diseases or NCDs by one third by 2030. Cancer is one of the killer NCDs. How will we accelerate progress toward these goals? Our panelists will help us understand or perhaps unpack how can we make progress fast enough to save lives from cancer. Also, heads of our countries, presidents, and prime ministers of our countries will be meeting at the United Nations General Assembly and convene a high-level meeting on NCDs in September 2018. And we do hope stronger action will ensure to reduce cancer burden globally. Let me introduce our distinguished panelists today. Twee Cook Bilon, who manages the Global World Cancer Day campaign at the International Union Against Cancer 
o u i c c dr sawantar soma sundram who is on the panel of u i c c or international union against cancer and president and medical director of national cancer society of malaysia she is also on the board of asian ncd alliance not forgetting dr surya kant president of national college of chest physicians past president of indian chest society president of indian medical association in lucknow and professor and head of department of respiratory medicine king george's medical university kgmu dr surya kant also presented me uh, his textbook which i'm holding in my hand um, authored by him on lung cancer last month and uh, and our other guest is shobha warrior a senior journalist and editor who has also authored a series of noted books including his days with bapu and the little flower girl she also authored a very important article on palliative care documenting best practices which should be scaled up well be before we listen to our first panelist today let me request you all to keep sending us your question either by using a chat function or raising virtual hand of the webinar tool keep sending the questions while panelists present while well, it's over to you to cook belong who manages the global world cancer day campaign at the international union again cancer or uicc let's listen in thank you very much ashok um good morning good afternoon uh good evening everyone um i'm very pleased to have the opportunity to talk to you today about world cancer day as we are less than 48 hours away from the day itself on sunday 4th of february Now, I'd firstly also like to thank the journalists, bloggers, underwriters joining in uh, today, giving their attention to one of the most important health issues the world is facing. So today in this briefing call, I hope to highlight the many ways in which the media around the world can inform, can educate, raise awareness, and inspire conversation and action around one of the world's most deadly diseases. Our World Cancer Day is truly the single initiative on the global health calendar that rallies and unites the world under one banner of cancer in a positive and really inspiring way. And what we hope to achieve with this day is that we raise awareness and education, but not only that, that we push for government and individual action in reducing the global cancer burden. Now this year World Cancer Day 2018 will be especially momentous with the adoption of the 2017 cancer resolution by the World Health Organization in May and together with the anticipated UN high level meeting on non-communicable diseases which Ashok mentioned in his introduction that will be ha happening later this year in September and both milestones will only act to sharpen the world's attention and the world's focus on our response to cancer. 2018 also marks the final year of the We Can I Can campaign, which is this empowering message that everyone as individuals and as as a collective, uh, we can all play our part in reducing the impact of cancer for ourselves for the people we love, our communities, and the wider world. And as I mentioned um, at the top of my presentation, the World Cancer Day will be taking place on a Sunday. And it represents a critical opportunity to engage with you all, the media, to ensure informed coverage that inspires deeper dialogue and conversations on the important issues in cancer. So for this year's World Cancer Day, our media stories calling for equal access to cancer care, treatment and services around the world to reduce the premature cancer death so that no matter where you were born, where you live, your ethnicity or your income, each person should receive the life-saving diagnosis, treatment and care they need. And as we come together today and as we continue to work as the international cancer community 
works to fulfill the global targets of reducing cancer deaths and NCD deaths by 25%, we really have to address the inequities that affects our most vulnerable population groups, including the indigenous, immigrant, refugee, rural and remote and lower socioeconomic groups. And we hope that you will take World Cancer Day's story on an inequity which affects all of us and use it as an opportunity to call on your government and advocate for your readers, viewers and followers. And we really do urge the media who have access to powerful and far-reaching platforms to be a voice for the underrepresented and the overlooked groups who are missing out on the cancer diagnosis, treatment and care they need. So the World Cancer Day global press release is available to the media under embargo and I'd be happy to share with this with you after the call. But what I'd like to to conclude with is to encourage you um, among the media community to share your opinions, your stories, your thoughts, your experience and perspectives and create wider conversations on social media. Tag them with the official hashtags of World Cancer Day and We Can I Can so that these discussions that we're having not only today but throughout this weekend is to keep cancer on the top of the global health agenda. So we're expecting thousands of activities to happen all around the world um, this coming World Cancer Day on Sunday. And our supporters are part of this movement that's mobilizing action and inspiring change and a movement that's being talked, read and heard about around the world with over 11,000 press mentions in 135 countries this past 2017 World Cancer Day. So I hope that the, the information that I've presented here to you today around the World Cancer Day objectives in raising awareness and pushing for government action and individual action, as well as the global story and our focus on calling for equal access to cancer care, treatment and services, that that's inspired you to take part and join us and thousands of supporters around the world this coming World Cancer Day, Sunday 4th of February. Thank you very much. Bring in Dr. Sontori Somasundram, who is on board of UICC, or International Union Against Cancer, and President and Medical Director of National Cancer Society of Malaysia. It's over to you, Doctor. Thank you, Ashok. Good evening, everyone from Malaysia. Um, I'd like to start to say that as we ponder on the World Cancer Day messaging of We Can, I Can that Tui had mentioned, and also looking forward to the World Cancer Congress in Malaysia in October this year, we need to ask a question. And the question is, what is the significant change we'd like to achieve in the region? The combined WHO regions of Southeast Asia and Asia Pacific constitute a diverse mix of some of the world's least developed countries, as well as the most rapidly emerging economies. Developing countries like Malaysia struggle with a double disease burden as they transition through the complex changes of patterns of health, disease and morbidity, resulting primarily from the economic and societal changes in an aging population. And though economic wealth has increased, investments into social infrastructure have been thwarted by political and social factors, leading to a fragmentation of healthcare policies and resources. And despite many of these countries in the region having expressed a high level of commitment combating non-communicable diseases, we feel that efforts are directed primarily towards specific diseases um, which seem easier to tackle than cancer, yeah. such as cardiovascular and diabetes. So the importance of cancer control outside of tobacco efforts um, can be, is questionable in many countries. Speaking directly on Malaysia's efforts, Malaysia is classified by the World Bank as a high middle income country with an average annual growth rate of 7%. So, in the region, we're considered to be a fairly rich country. 
Our population is currently 31 million, with an average increase of about 1.5% annually. Cancer is the second leading cause of morbidity after heart disease in the country. We have an annual incidence of about 37,000, with approximately 21 or 22,000 deaths every single year. And at any one time, we have about 100,000 people living with cancer. The issue that we're going to be facing is that our incidence and thus mortality is expected to increase by 50%, over 50% by 2025. At this point of time, you know, though the absolute numbers of incidence and mortality may seem low in comparison to many developed countries, um, such as Australia, who has the same sort of population as us, it has to be noted with, with great alarm that the risk of dying of cancer in Malaysia is the same as in Australia. Even though Australia has three times the number of cancer cases Malaysia does. So the question begs to be asked, you know, why are so many Malaysians dying of cancer? Why do we have such high death rates? Especially since in today's world, many countries are boasting a steady or declining death rate from cancer. So what are these challenges that Malaysia faces? We know that the high death rates, the high mortality is primarily due to one, late diagnosis, and two, access to treatment. Now, one of the key global health goals around the world is the achievement of having universal health care, which Malaysia has claimed to have accomplished. And in previous years, in previous decades, I think this might have been fairly true. However, with an increasing population and changing health behaviors, we know the incidences of NCDs are rapidly increasing and overwhelming health services. And as mentioned before, though the economic wealth of the country has increased, health budgets have not benefited from an injection of finances. As such, health systems within the public sector have seen little or no growth, but they service a growing population. In contrast, though, the private sector has grown exponentially, which caters to a select population. So with a healthcare budget, which is about 4.5% of its GDP, 50% is nearly from the private sector. The spend is less than the minimum 3% public financing encouraged by the UN. And thus the disparities and inequities in cancer care in Malaysia are becoming increasingly evident. So in, a, in conclusion, to, to tackle cancer control in Malaysia, and I believe this is true to many countries in the region, we need to learn from countries that have shown and these countries have shown that strong leadership, not only from the health ministry, but from the whole of government across the political divide drives change. So we need to change the mindset from looking at health as a burden to be one of an economic driver and strong policies to prioritize cancer control, enhancing data collection in systems, investing into cancer registries, national cancer control policies, and equally important Strengthening primary healthcare networks for the prevention and early detection of cancer are integral to decreasing the needless deaths from cancer. And as Tui said, there are many steps that can be taken. But firstly, we need the commitment of all stakeholders to embrace we can, I can, prioritize cancer and stop the deaths. So go ahead for World Cancer Day and, and make a change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. That was the medical director of National Cancer Society of Malaysia, Dr. Santari Samasundram, who is also on the board of UICC or International Union Against Cancer. Dr. Samasundram is also on the board of Asian NC Asian NCD Alliance. Well, the perfect stage to invite our next panelist who has been in the spotlight in CNS webinars on tobacco Thank control. TB, asthma, lung cancer, among other issues. 
Well, welcome back, Professor Surya Kant, who is the president of the National College of Chess Physician, past president of Indian Chess Society, president of the Indian Medical Association in Lucknow, and professor and head of the Department of Respiratory Medicine, King George's Medical University, KGMU. He authored a textbook on lung cancer, which was presented to international delegation, of which I was part of last month. It's well, it's over to you, Dr. Surya Ramak, uh, Surya Kant. Wow. Yes. Yes, Ashok Ram Sarup, how are you? Well, well, G, you go ahead. Yeah, I still remember your uh, visit to Lucknow. That was a great visit, wonderful. We are having wonderful memories with you. Thank you, Dr. G. Uh, should I start my presentation? Yes, you can go yes, ahead, please. doctor. Okay, Shobhaji, yes. Can I? Yes, please. Yes, please do. Page is yours. Okay, okay, okay. So basically, I'm a chess physician as uh, it was introduced in my introduction. So I will limit myself to the lung cancer to which I am the expert. So... Okay, uh, if you see cancer in general, then they arises from the transformation of a normal cells into tumor cells in a multi-stage process that generally progresses from a precancerous lesion to a malignant tumor. Cancer is one of the leading causes of morbidity and mortality worldwide with approximately 14 million new cases in 2012. The number of new cases is expected to rise by about 70% over the next two decades. Cancer is the second leading cause of death globally and was responsible for 8.8 .8 billion deaths in 2015. Globally, near one in six deaths is due to cancer. In India, there are an estimated 25 to 30 lakhs cases at any point of time, with 8 lakhs new cases being detected every year in our country. If you see the lung cancer, then lung cancer is the most common cause of cancer-related deaths worldwide responsible for over 1 million deaths annually. So this is the most important killer among the all cancer deaths. Each year, more people die of lung cancer than of the next three leading cause of cancer death combined of breast, colon, and prostate cancer. Despite recent advances, lung cancer remains a disease with a dismal prognosis. Although one year survival has improved over the past few decades, overall five year survival has remained relatively unchanged at a 12% to 16%. Globally, lung cancer has been the most common cancer since 1985. So uh, almost uh, more than 30 years, three decades, both in terms of incidence and mortality rate. So this is the importance of lung cancer we can understand. It is the largest contributor to the new cancer diagnosis, 1 lakh, 13 lakh, 50,000 new cases, 12.4% of the total new cancer cases. 12.4% of total new cancer cases and to the death from cancer that is attributable to 17.6% of the total cancer deaths. Means almost every fifth death due to cancer is due to lung cancer. Lung cancer incidence and mortality rates are highest in the United States and the developed countries and relatively lower in Central America and most of the Africa. However, there has been a large relative increase in the numbers of cases of lung cancer in developing countries. And if you see the Indian scenario in India, the lung cancer constitutes 6.9% of all new cancer cases and 9.3% of all cancer-related deaths in both sexes. That is the commonest cancer and cause of cancer-related mortality in men with the highest reported incidence in, from Mizoram, a very northeast state, very small state, but due to high prevalence of smoking, the, the data of morbidity and mortality is very high as far as lung cancer is concerned in Mizoram. Uh, and if you see the incidence and pattern of lung cancer differ as per geographic region because of the uh, ethnicity and largely affect the prevalence and pattern of smoking. High smoking areas have high lung cancer, low smoking areas have low cancer. The overall five-year survival rate of lung cancer is dismal with approximately 15% in developed countries and 5% in developing countries. So very poor and pathetic scenario as far as the lung cancer is concerned. So if you see that the, uh, it is the most common cancer in different cities like Bombay, Delhi, and Bhopal, and if you see increase in incidence is 1 to 5% per year globally and estimated 1.6 million people across the world annually. 
So this is the uh, prevalence of lung cancer throughout the world, 1.61 billion. And if you see the Indian scenario, lung is the most lung cancer is the most common in males, and it is also very common in females. And if you see the etiological factor, other than the tobacco smoking, there are a lot of factors also. Although, however, smoking is the most important risk factor for lung cancer. If smokers have tenfold more risk of lung cancer than non-smoker, and risk is twentyfold in every heavy smoker. They constitute ten percent of high smoker die of lung cancer. And following a smoking cessation, is still there is a risk that that risk decreases, but even after the ten years, it is two point five times. And passive smoking, environmental tobacco scope also important cause. In India, we have total twelve crore smokers, and tobacco kills nearly ten lakh people in India each year. So tobacco is the biggest killer as far as India is concerned. There is a latest uh, survey by global that is called adult global adult tobacco survey gets, and this gets shows that thirty four point six percent of adults they use tobacco in one or another form. And 8.7% adults used the smoke tobacco, that is smoking, which is responsible for the development of lung cancer. <coughs> so another important factor, other than the smoking, is the biomass fuel. This is very common uh, form of cooking in India, and this produces a lot of exposure of rural females, especially for this biomass fuel. And other than the occupational factors, also are important in India. Different type of occupations produce different types of exposure of asbestos and other material, and they are also important ecological factor. Other than atmospheric pollution, recently India has been in news because of the poor quality index, and uh, with the risk of more than 400, uh, the measurement of air quality index, most of the cities of India they have crossed this limit, that is high danger zone of air pollution level. So. Uh, this uh, urban dwellers uh, have more air pollution, and that's why they have two times greater risk than people in rural areas. And then we have important uh, etiological factor in the form of scar cancer. So the lungs, which are having fibrosis or scar due to tuberculosis, sarcoidosis, or cryptogenic fibrosing, alveolitis, congenital cystic lung disease, they are also at risk for developing lung cancer. And COPD also itself a important risk factor. And then we have some protective diet and diet increasing the risk. So animal protein, animal fat, cholesterol, and high dairy products diets they are the increasing risk factor for the development of cancer. Familial disposition, if you see, then first degree relatives have 2.4 fold excess risk for developing lung cancer, and certain oncogenes are also responsible for the development of lung cancer. If you see the symptoms of uh, presentation of lung cancer, patient can be sometimes asymptomatic and Some incidental finding on chest X-ray, but most of the time they are symptomatic. There can be constitutional symptoms in terms of malaise, anorexia, weight loss, or there can be respiratory symptoms, new respiratory symptom or worsening of old symptoms. The common symptoms are cough, hemoptysis, that is blood in sputum, breathlessness, chest pain. Symptoms due to compression of adjoining structure can be due to dysphagia, that is due to compression of esophagus. There is a difficulty in swallowing. Superior vena cava syndrome, compression of superior vena cava, a very important vein that is draining into the heart that get compressed due to this tumor of lung cancer. Horner syndrome is a uh, various symptoms of this due to the compression of sympathetic chain. Hoarseness of voice, that is change in voice occurs due to the involvement of left recurrental laryngeal nerve. And symptoms due to metastasis means the disease of lung cancer has spread to another uh, site or organ. And one third of the patient present with symptoms due to metastatic spread. This metastasis can be to lymph node, can be liver, bone, and brain. And some symptoms due to paraneoplastic syndromes can also be there. And if you see the chest X-ray, a lot of findings are present on chest X-ray from higher prominence to the bony erosion. Then sputum cytology for cancer cells can be done. Fluid fluid cytology for cancer cells can be done. Lymph node fine needle aspiration cytology and biopsy can be done for the diagnosis of lung cancer. CT thorax can be done, bronchoscopy can be done, endobronchial ultrasound can be done, transbronchial needle aspiration can be done, percutaneous transthoracic needle biopsy and FNAC can be done, open lung biopsy can be done, and tumor marker study can be done, which is of help for diagnosis of lung cancer. Then certain investigation for searching metastasis means whether the disease has spread to other organs or not, like mediastinoscopy for liver metastasis, the ultrasound for bony metastasis, X-ray and the certain labels. And brain metastasis is the CT scan or CSF. Then 
treatment can be the basically we know that lung cancer is a two type non small cell lung cancer and small cell lung cancer and treatment for non small lung cancer can be the surgery up to stage 3a it is operable surgery can be done beyond that surgery can't be done then the options left are chemotherapy radiotherapy and some certain other modalities like laser therapy and immunotherapy for a small cell lung cancer this is a aggressive disease 70% present with extensive disease at present 60% have extra thoracic metastasis supraclavicular lymph node 30% bone marrow 30% liver 20% cns 10% Chemotherapy is usually chemosensitive, so chemotherapy is the treatment modality of choice for small cell lung cancer. Radiotherapy can be another choice. Surgery has got limited role. Prognosis: If you see the overall five-year survival for all types of lung cancer is only five to fifteen percent. So very apathetic situation as far as the survival and prognosis of lung cancer patients is concerned. The prognostic factor can be the tumor histology, stage of the disease, etc., etc. Now the question is. is it a preventable disease yes most of the time it is preventable disease now what can be the ways and means for preventing it very important is smoking cessation there can be certain diet dietary changes there can be some certain lifestyle modification and of course very important aspect is the control of air pollution mark twain said that giving up smoking is easy i have done it 100 times so it's not so easy and health benefits after quitting if you see the lung cancer reduction 50% reduction in 10 years after smoking quitting so treatment options for tobacco cessation can be a lot of we are running a smoking cessation clinic here in king george medical university lucknow uttar pradesh india and i think in india has got so many other center also for a smoking cessation and they are uh, offering lot of treatment lot of advices motivational efforts psychological effects and uh, uh, we are having some good control programs for smoking cessation if you see the diet and lifestyle changes the, the dietary factors that uh, increase the risk are overweight and obesity excess alcohol consumption some forms of salting and fermenting fish very hot salty drinks and food alpha toxin which is a fungal contamination of the food dietary changes can lower the risk of specific cancer up to 50% bent cancer 33% of lung cancer can be reduced with the help of diet modification so diets like onion and garlic carbs broccoli brussels sprouts cereals fish liver and seafood milk yogurt curd small fish they all are beneficial uh, for the against the development of lung cancer and is diets like spinach carrots sweet potatoes apples grapes and oranges fruits they are also uh, supposed to be the scavengers for carcinogens and that's why they help in prevention of lung cancer <laughs> and cancer and other cancer also cancer is also also strongly associated with social and economic status cancer risk factors are highest in groups with the least education in addition patients in lower socio economic classes have consistently poor survival rates than those in higher strata regular physical activity is also a protective effect on cancer and british researcher have shown that those who do not eat meat had significantly fewer cancers overall than those who did so non vegetarians are requested to become vegetarian if they really want to get rid of or they really want to have prevention of cancer in them controlling air pollution is also a very important strategy for reducing the lung cancer and other cancer if forestation is the answer planting more than trees 11000 million trees are required to combat air pollution globally so a lot of uh, good target is there for air forestation and by ways of means of chimney and etc by controlling air pollution a lot of can be done and another thing is in india which is the national green tribunal which established in 2010 it has got some punitive action also and our prime minister narendra modi has give up scheme and the ujjwala yojana pradhan mantri ujjwala yojana that is giving the clean fuel better life so it helps in reducing so many reducing diseases especially in rural india rural females and uh, this is uh, basically in a last uh, latest budget of the india passed on yesterday only first priority to that has promised to provide lpg connection to 80 million families in this country which help a lot to combat air pollution so this could be a major game changer in future for prevention of chronic respiratory diseases and as well as the lung cancer in, in india so thank you very much uh, thank you rahul thank you shobadi thank you ashok kram sir for providing a wonderful opportunity uh, on this platform i'm really obliged thank you thank we you have a lot very of questions waiting for you dr surekant after some time Yes please continue Yeah sure
Sure, sure. I'm Thank you to... very much, Professor Surya Kant, for sharing your expert remarks. Before we open the forum for interactive session, now let us listen to Ms. Shoba Warrior, a senior journalist and editor, who has also authored a series of noted books, including His Days with Bob and The Little Flower Girl. <laughs> she also authored a very important article on palliative, palliative care documenting best practices which should be scaled up for cancer care as well. Well, it's over to you, Ms. Shoba. Hello, good evening. Good evening. Uh, good evening. Yeah. Uh, uh, actually, I'm here not as a journalist. I'm okay. here as a person uh, who lost, I, I lost my husband to cancer, uh, to lung cancer. He was a non-smoker. And uh, World Cancer Day is on February 4th. I lost my husband on the 5th of February, four years ago. And uh, when he was diagnosed, it was a asymptomatic, very late diagnosis. When it was uh, diagnosed, stage four, metastatic, everywhere. And uh, at that time, actually, my knowledge of cancer was very, very little. And I had no idea about palliative care. And the one grouse I have against many oncologists is that they don't disseminate information properly. They didn't tell us. The first thing my husband told the doctor was that he didn't want to extend his life through chemotherapy. He wanted some quality of life because he was told that he, would, he had only six months to one year time. And the doctor said he would, because he had breathlessness, he would have quality of life if he took uh, uh, chemo. But the chemo, chemo made his life miserable. The five, year, five months he was alive and it was miserable. And at that time, actually, we asked several times whether it is palliative and what exactly the kind of uh, treatment, the medicines that uh, he was being given, but uh, we didn't get any proper information. And uh, actually, unfortunately, I met a doctor who is called the father of palliative care in India, Dr. Rajagopal. He won the Padma Shri uh, last week, and which is a major, major decision by the government, I feel, uh, to make, pal make palliative care and that is the information to more people. So I met him just a week before I lost my husband. That was when I understood that he could have a quality of, quality of life, the time that he was alive, which was denied because of various reasons. And that is when I decided that uh, this is palliative care is, uh, people should know about palliative care. Doctors should talk to cancer patients about uh, palliative care. And, uh, we have one doctor working in one corner. He started in Kori Kod in Kerala, and now he works in Trivandrum. So one, I was in, I am, I live in Chennai. So this last one week, there was no time to give any any kind of palliative care to my husband. But on the 14th day after after I lost him, I went with Dr. Rajagopal. I visited so many of his patients who were in living in the interiors of Trivandrum, in the suburbs, and where uh, no, tree, no doctors were going. That is where he used to go. He was, the way he was taking care of those people. And that, that was also one time I realized that doctor told me that uh, many people without, uh, the, because of lack of knowledge, so many of them spend so much money selling their whatever uh, savings they have, uh, selling the house or whatever property they have, even when they come to know that uh, there is no hope. Instead of giving palliative care, they go to many hospitals, followed uh, various kinds of treatments. So then uh, this palliative, when the last, during the last ch stages of a patient, a cancer patient, it is very, very important that they should know about palliative care. That is one uh, care which is not known to many people. 
so many people majority of the people have absolutely no idea about palliative care so i i i have been writing about dr rajagopal and i have been writing about palliative care but uh, i don't know whether that is enough so dissemination of information is very very important like uh, uh, dr soundri Saund said the change has to come it is not only uh, curative treatment palliative care also is very very important i think we need to have uh, many more dr rajagopal in uh, india when you have the maximum number of cancer patients and maximum number of people dying of cancer and uh, maximum number of people who are diagnosed when they are in the later stages i hope it happens that is the reason why i am talking today thank you very much thank you very very much indeed uh, for a very inspiring story uh, ms uh, shobha warrior well that brings us to the end of experts presentation now let us begin the open session participants please keep sending your questions using chat function or raise your virtual hand on the webinar screen well his open session begins right now uh, we have a lot many questions already pouring in uh, there is a question from dr bismay sharma uh, dr bismay sharma would you like to ask the question yourself if you are there would you like to ask the question she wants to know that there is a huge disparity in cancer screening policies around the world what's what is the comment of the panelists on that and how can it be changed for better access for early detection and screening of cancer would any of the panelists like to answer that dr soma sundaram okay, would you okay, like sure, right? yes please yes yeah, dr surika so much should be responsible uh, actually, the screening criteria that depends upon the whether the, you are having a low prevalence uh, cancer country or a high prevalence cancer country. If you are a low prevalence country, then of course, uh, on the basis of high suspicion index, uh, the screening should be done. And in a country where the smoke cancer uh, prevalence is very high, incidence is very high, then of course, then a mass screening can be done. So that is the usual policy. In India, we don't have any cancer screening policy. Only depend depending upon the uh, the uh, clinical uh, suspicion, there is a uh, provision for screening and diagnosis. Uh, thank so you. Sir, what, what I wanted someone... to know. Yes. Yes, please continue. Yeah, actually, I wanted to know. There is. Um, I have read somewhere that. in some countries developed countries there is a uh, policy that under general health checkup it is compulsory for example for women above 30 years of age to undergo the cervical cancer screening but in countries like india or some other asian countries it is not there in the general health checkup which i think is very important for the early detection so what's your comment on this i think that uh, this policy should come into action so that early detection can be implied I think you are 100% right that after 30 years, uh, uh, there should be regular screening for the early detection of breast cancer as well as the cervical cancer, the ovarian cancer. And for all three, these are the female cancers and uh, early I mean, the screening should be done regularly. This is true. We have a question from Iptihal Fadahil for Tui. Iptihal, would you like to ask the question yourself? Yes. Ittihal Fadahil, would you like to ask? Y yes. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Yes. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm asking about what should be the outcome or the cancer control outcome uh, priority for the high level meeting 2018 for the NCD high level meeting. Dr. Soma Sundaram, would you like to say something and to you also, perhaps? Sure. I mean, I think that's a question for Tui to answer. <laughs> okay, Tui. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Son, and thank you, Iptal, for for your question. I think that um, I I personally would not be the person to give you the most comprehensive answer in response to that, and that's something that we can certainly. Uh, take a look at together um, in terms of our advocacy team that's working very, very closely on the NCD uh, high-level meeting in September. So certainly I can take that question to, to our advocacy team so that you can have a much more informed response. Can I, um, this is Sandra here, can I just go yes. back to the last question as well about yes, screening? We, yes, uh, we wanted your comment on that, Doctor, please. Yes, sorry. <laughs> um, one is that one has to note there's a difference between screening when there's nothing wrong with you and you're checking up for cancer and actually the recognition of the early symptoms and signs of cancer. So when it comes to screening where you're actually doing tests when there's nothing wrong with you, yes, I do agree. Um, it's very, very difficult for low resource countries to actually have um, national programs on screening. Having said that, WHO actually have tiered screening protocols depending on resources. So depending on the resources a country has, um, WHO has recognized that there are different um, tests or different actions that you can take, which could help um, recognize or earlier detect um, cancers in the country. When it comes to the earlier recognition of cancer, I think that's where all of us can do something um, in, in every single country. My the, earlier, the earlier recognition of cancer really really falls on the lap of primary health care workers um, to recognize that the sim signs and symptoms of cancer and making sure that there's a good pathway in terms of transition to a tertiary or to a hospital um, for treatment to be done. I think that is essential in many countries. Okay. I am. I also think one point. Uh, I also want to share one point. That in hello. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Can we take up some more questions, Dr. Vishma Sharma? We can come back to you a little yeah, later. Yeah. Yes. Raj, uh, we have Zafar Kedwai from Star uh, Paper in Bangladesh, uh, who has a question for Dr. Soma Sundaram. Uh, Zafar says, "Thank you, Dr. Sun Soma Sundaram, for highlighting fragmented health responses." With the talk around universal health coverage, how can we ensure prevention of avoidable cancers and improving care? I think it starts, thanks for the question, and I really think it starts with advocacy and engagement of all the stakeholders. Unfortunately, in many countries, including Malaysia, in terms of um, cancer and, and many health issues, we're very reactive in our response. And most of the reaction is towards treatment. So we spend a lot of resources in terms of treating of disease, but we don't actually look at the prevention and early detection of the disease. Um, so even if when you look at Malaysia, our healthcare spend on the prevention of diseases and health promotion is only about 2%, which is very low. So we need a lot more voice um, on health promotion, on the earlier detection, of, of cancers and, and other related NCDs. And because NCDs as a whole have comorbidities, um, co-risk factors, we need to look at a, a way that we can address all the different NCDs together and maximize the outcomes. So the advocacy, I think, is really important. The media is incredibly important um, in highlighting the need for earlier interventions, and also in um, in in using the resources you have out there, which are your civil society organisations, as well as your survivors of all the different NCDs. Their voices are very very strong, and if the media and countries tap into those voices and those stories, changing the mindset to NCDs and cancers, changing that stigma. Words, NCDs, and cancers 
to make a huge difference. Thank you. And uh, Shobha Warrior has brought up a very important point about palliative care. And I would like to ask uh, Dr. Soma Sundaram and Dr. Surekant, like is palliative care available in, uh, uh, for cancer and other chronic conditions in a country like Malaysia? And what more needs to be done so that palliative care becomes a reality for people, not only with cancer, but also others? Uh, this this is a very okay. important point, I think, which has come up. So uh, it is. I would like the two medical experts to please elaborate on this. Um, OK, if, if I start first, yes. it, it's yes. a very important area. And the first way to change um, people's outlook to palliative care is to change that stigma to that word, palliative care or hospice care. In Malaysia, we do have palliative care. We have palliative care in hospitals and we have home care as well through NGOs. But the pickup rate or the user rate of palliative care is very, very low. And even though we have morphine and we have pain man uh, management systems in place, um, people don't use it. Because as soon as you mention palliative care or hospice care, they feel that you're throwing them in a corner to die. And, and that is the mindset for many people in Malaysia. So we need to change the discourse. As doctors ourselves, we need to learn how to communicate better with patients. Um, and not just at the end stage, but throughout the whole stages of cancer, from the beginning to end. We need to be able to communicate with patients to be able to really understand what their needs are. Not just that we want to do treatment, but what the needs of that patient is as well. And so that we change the scenario from a doctor-driven treatment protocol to a patient-centric treatment protocol. Um, and the idea of palliative care, the idea of the thought of dying from cancer, or even living, from can living with cancer, but with mor morbidities, needs to be addressed from the very start and not just at the end of the, of the journey. Thank you. Dr. Surikant, would you uh, like to ask? Madam Shoma, yes, I'm 100% I'm agree with Dr. Soma Sundaram that usually the concept of palliation means the terminal care. So uh, I don't think, I am also agree with Soma Sundaram, and I don't think that palliation is the last step. Palliative care starts once you diagnose the case of a cancer. And in our country, in India also, it is the most neglected part that we don't consider for palliation. Rather, it is always considered as that now no option is left, surgery can't be done, radiotherapy can't be done, chemotherapy has been done, and now it is not possible for any maintenance chemotherapy or patient uh, general condition is uh, not suitable for chemotherapy. Then we only think of palliative care. That is a wrong concept. I, in the King George Medical University, when my patient of lung cancer got admitted into the cancer ward, there is a facility for a light music in the department. Person used to listen bhajan, ghazal, and Sufi music whenever it becomes a part of that cancer ward in our department, in our department of respiratory medicine as a part of lung cancer unit, so that this light music then can uh, help him in healing as well as in changing the environment. Patient of lung cancer, they are not expecting that they will listen music in the ward in the morning and evening. And that's a different kind of gesture from my junior doctors, senior doctors, as well as the paramedical staff, that there should be a, a, a kind of a happier, a kind of a, a warmth uh, gesture from their attitude for the cancer patient. They should have uh, the uh, thinking of longevity. They should have a uh, ability, they should have boost up their morale. They should be given an opportunity to boost up their moral, morale for to fight against the story of cancer. So, in, uh, of course, this is a neglected area in our institution also, in our country also. But now that uh, time has come, I just heard the story of uh, uh, Shobha Warrior, um, the great inspirational story and uh, Dr. Raj Gopal, uh, the help, uh, the, the work which he got appreciated by government of India. So I think uh, really people need such type of, and I'm 100% agree with the 
uh, Shobha, Warrior, that we do, we need a lot of Dr. Raj Gopal in this country. We need a such type of persons in this country to enhance the palliative care in this country. Thank you. Uh, Roger Paul Kamugasha from uh, Health Times Africa wants to ask a question. Roger, would you like to ask the question yourself? Roger wants to know how can the media step up the cancer advocacy and as cancer awareness is not adequate, especially in low resource settings. Uh, Tui, would you like to say something on that? Thank you very much for that question. I think that there is uh, something to be said about raising the awareness, raising the public health literacy. I believe that uh, the international cancer community um, are working very hard to not only increase their public health literacy, but also the government health literacy to, uh, to ensure that government understand that this is a priority area, this is something that we need to, um, as the Dr. Um, Thorn mentioned, that it's not just about um, looking at a health issue as a burden, um, but it, as an investment, and one where that, an investment that will have its return on investment in the uh, reducing economic impact. <laughs> Oh, we, certainly, in terms of the media's responsibilities to ensure that we translate the information that are coming from the, the health and international agencies, as well as national cancer societies like the National Cancer Society of Malaysia, in translating this into information that um, can be can be digested um, by health ministers, education ministers, and governments around the world. Yes. And certainly, media do have a very important role to play in, and we've seen that all around the world in different causes um, and different issues where media have been able to push for more action, uh, particularly at a government level. Okay, uh, uh, Dr. Shivani Sharma wants to ask a question. Uh, Dr. Shivani Sharma, would you like to ask a question? This is organized by UICC. What is UICC? Have you heard of UICC? He wants to know what can be done to reduce the alarming use of plastics in food industry these days, globally. Is that plastic carcinogenic? And the sort of food which we are eating, is it abetting cancer? International Union for... Dr. Soma Sundaram, would you like to say something on that? Um, okay. Um, I don't, to be honest, I don't know much in terms of how much plastic um, increase the risk of, of cancer. Um, I think overall around the world, it has to be noted that certain types of plastics, yes, does is harmful to health. What what I mentioned before in terms of how do we change um, attitudes, how do we change within a country, is really ensuring that all the stakeholders play a part um, in that change. So when it comes to reducing the amount of plastics they're using, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, it's not just looking at it as a health issue, as, as, as you think it might be, but to look at it in totality. So getting the whole of government involved in it, um, in terms of getting government in terms of your Department of Environment and Department of Health and the other departments in government understanding what the issue is and becoming advocates for the issue. And I think that that relates to health and it relates to cancer as well. The Ministry of Health in Malaysia is, is proactive in its way against cancer. However, because it doesn't have the whole of government support, the actions that it wants to do might not get fully um, implemented. So that whole idea of whole of government and all of stakeholders, government as well as outside of government, playing a part is, is very, very important for any change to occur. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Surikant, would you like to add something to that? And yes. also, could you please elaborate on the link between air pollution and lung cancer, diet and lung cancer and diet, and okay. not only lung cancer, but other types of cancers as well? As uh, Dr. Shivani okay, Sharma uh, had raised that question. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you, Shobhaji. It has already been uh, said in the all kind of medical literature in the world. Maybe Indian medical literature, maybe Arabic medical literature, maybe Greek medical literature, maybe Chinese, maybe others. That if you live close to the nature and according to the nature, then of course you will remain healthy. So that's why you see whenever we take breath, whenever we take breath, half a liter of air we take inside the lungs and same amount of air is taken out during expiration. That's why the breathing in is called inspiration and breathing out is called expiration. And when there is a permanent expiration, it is called expiring. So during this inspiration and expiration process, whatever you inspire from the atmosphere, it basically uh, always correlated with the health of human being. If you are inspiring a good quality of air, you will remain healthy because this air will provide you oxygen, not only oxygen, but this is oxygen is life, basically. Oxygen is life. Without oxygen, you can't live. So if there's a poor quality of air which you are breathing in your, from your atmosphere, this is this basically not a hampers the quality of lung health, but basically it hampers also the body's health, in total health of human being. So air pollution is not only the source of so many respiratory diseases, but it also may cause the increased risk for 2.5 time increased risk of lung cancer also. So, and that's why if you see in India, India has been a very hot uh, news in last few days, few weeks, when Delhi, either Delhi was the uh, poor quality, in, uh, air quality index having, or some other parts of the country having air quality index of even worse than 400. 400 is the criteria where you have the very severe poor quality of air index and India has gone under this for last two months at least so many times Delhi the national capital as well as other cities they have a very poor quality of air index even more than 300 and 400. So this poor quality of uh, air basically produces in long term a lot of malignancies including lung cancer and a lot of other side effects also health hazards also. For example, chronic headache, migraine, hypertension, heart attacks, and so many other allergic disorders, so many diseases, chronic bronchitis, emphysema, asthma, and of course, increased prevalence of tuberculosis and so many non-communicable and communicable diseases. Uh, as far as the policy is concerned for air quality, good air quality, then uh, in India, we have a National Green Tribunal, NGT formed in year 2010, which regulates the environmental pollution in this country and uh, it has got a lot of uh, laws uh, regulations for controlling the air pollution as well as other things and as i mentioned in my powerpoint presentation thanks to our prime minister Sri narendra modi who has uh, given two schemes the give it up scheme and the pradhan mantri ujjala yojana by which he has introduced now uh, you see the budget national budget for government of india passed yesterday only and in the last day budget the government has assured that there will be new LPG connections to the 8 crore, 8 crore families, poor families of this country who are not using LPG as a uh, cooking fuel, but they are using wooden and some other forms of uh, fuel which are producing biomass fuel. So biomass fuel is also polluting the air. The smoking is also polluting air because we know that once somebody smokes, only 30% of smoke goes inside the smoker's lung, but the rest of the 70% remain in the environment. As a second hand smoking, passive smoking, or environmental tobacco smoke, that permanently pollutes the air or, air or atmosphere. So smoking, air pollution, environmental tobacco smoke, biomass fuel, and of course the vehicular pollution is also very important source of uh, air pollution. So that should also be controlled uh, if you really want to live healthy, life and if we really want to control the lung cancer and other cancer. Thank you, Shobhan. Thank you. Uh, Varuna Khullar wanted to make a comment. Varuna, are you there? Would you like to comment? Yes, Varuna. Oh. Oh. 
okay now so i will now close we have come to the end of the webinar i will close with a comment from dr p s sharma he is a senior tb uh, specialist uh, dr sharma says creating awareness about cancer and engaging different organizations is very important and service clubs like the lions rotary club and professional bodies like uh, the medical indian medical association tb association of india and likewise in other countries they can play a vital role in this regard and with this we come to the end of today's webinar my heartfelt gratitude to all the panelists and participants for taking part in this webinar and enriching it with their valuable inputs special thanks to the international union against tuberculosis and lung disease for helping us host this webinar as you already know the webinar gets streamed on youtube and the podcast links will be shared with you and made available in public domain very soon and lest we forget World Cancer Day will take place on 4th of February with the tagline as to he said we can i can all of us can take various actions collectively as well as individually to reduce the impact that cancer has on individuals families and communities bye and have a good day